Mesdames et Messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed. They've given it everything on the global bucket. Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. If you love the games, we are the show for you. Each week we share stories from athletes and people behind the scenes to help you have more fun watching the games. I'm your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you? Hello. I feel like I'm dressed inappropriately for today's show. I feel uh, like I should be wearing all white. Because? Because we're talking cricket. Oh, okay. <laughs> you don't have to wear all white anymore. I know, but I Times feel like I should be sitting in a lawn chair with my appropriate whites, sipping some tea. Well, cricket is going to be back on the Olympic program in 2028, and we know that it's a complicated game, so we wanted to give ourselves a five-year learning curve. And we are joined by Andrew Nixon, a writer for Cricket Europe. He tells us what the inclusion of cricket means to the Olympic program. He tells us what the inclusion of cricket on the Olympic program means for the sport. And he gives us a little primer about the game. Take a listen. Andrew Nixon, thank you so much for joining us. Cricket is back in the games. Uh, yes, it's been, a, it's been a long time coming, Jill. Thank you for having me on the show. So cricket hasn't been in since 1900? Yeah, that's cricket? correct. Yeah, there were okay. 1900, there was two teams. Um, there was supposed to be four. Two didn't turn up. So it was Great Britain and France. In reality, it was an amateur low-level club from England against a bunch of British residents in Paris. Like all things early in the Olympics, nobody really knew they were in the Olympics. Yeah, there was an attempt to include it in the 1904 games in St. Louis and uh, the organisers and I know organisation and that Olympics are words you often hear together from my knowledge of it. <laughs> the organisers either didn't get enough entries or didn't request enough entries and it never and the competition never took place. So it's been a long time coming. So what is the response from the cricket world about getting back into the Olympics? It's mixed. The I think part of that is because it doesn't necessarily have much of an impact on those countries at the top of the game. The countries at the top of the game don't really need the Olympics as such. But from the cricket, for those who don't know, and I think that might be a lot of your listeners, the International Cricket Council is a very sort of top-heavy organisation. It has 108 members. Of those, 12 are considered full members and each get one vote at their annual conferences. 96 are called associate members, and between them, they get three votes. So as you can see, it's not particularly democratic in that sense. The annual revenue from the ICC from their TV rights and events and, and whatnot um, in the next sort of media rights cycle, which starts after the current World Cup, which, which finishes in the middle of November, is uh, 600 million US dollars a year. Of that, 230 million goes to one cricket board, which is the Board of Control for Cricket in India, the BCCI, who are already the richest cricket board in the world. <laughs> and the, those 96 associate members between them get 67.5 million US dollars a year. And within that, the countries right at the bottom will get round between so sort of thirty and fifty thousand US dollars a year. Which Holy if God. you do the maths, that means that some boards make less per year than the Indian board make per hour. So as you can see it's financially a very disparate organization. And I can see people probably listening on a podcast or you'd see your, your the open mouth uh, reaction and <laughs> That is a reaction. So I think in those countries that are already rich, already getting a lot of money, it's not going to have much of an impact. Those countries at the bottom, I have spoken to people in, who run cricket in places like Estonia, Mexico, and Brazil. Their 
governments that when they choose what sports to fund, they'll prioritise Olympic sports. And in some countries that are earning your 30, 40, 50,000 US dollars a year from the ICC, from their government could be getting up to 10 times that amount. So you can see there that it has a transformative impact on those countries at the bottom of the pecking order who are probably never even going to qualify for the Olympics. So I think they're talking about a six-team tournament. Those countries will be able to perhaps start professionalising cricket a lot more, invest in better facilities, better equipment, and generally bring on the game a lot more in those countries. So those countries towards the bottom, those associate member countries, most of them have been pushing for this for a long, long time. But the power base has been a bit not as keen on the Olympics for various reasons. Australia, who were one of the sort of top earning countries, they have always been keen on cr- cricket in the Olympics. They've always been pushing it. The English board didn't like it because it, it would interfere with the English domestic season and the English international season. The Indian board wasn't keen on it for a long time because it would mean more government oversight of cricket in India. For various reasons, those things have now changed. So the English international season has become more and more condensed and actually now more room to actually be able to send a team to an, an Olympic tournament. And I think for reasons with, that are probably beyond the scope of this podcast, the relationship between the BCCI and the Indian government has become a little incestuous, if I can use that term. Um, I mean, like their <laughs> yeah. Olympic committee has many issues as well so yeah a lot. so yeah so that's changed so those barriers have moved out of the way i know cricket has been the ioc has been very keen to get cricket into the olympics because they see how rich the game is in india and the olympics in india don't have a big share of the the market there i think one estimate i saw the other day said that the cricket being in the olympics will add about a hundred million dollars to the Olympic TV rights in India. So that's why the IOC have been keen to get cricket into the Olympics. Cricket, it's been a, a sort of will they, won't they relationship, if you like, for um, a long time now. I think last year, the ITC appointed the chair of the uh, Board of Control for Cricket in India to their Olympic working group. And I think that was when they finally started to really push it. Even, the, even then, I think, Having it in for 2028 in Los Angeles was always thought to be a long shot. Obviously, 2032 in Brisbane in Australia, where cricket's a major sport, was thought to be a better uh, chance. And everybody thought, you know, baseball's going for the Olympics, uh, baseball, softball, sorry, lacrosse, flag football, all games that are popular in all sports are popular in America. Cricket, not very popular in America. So I think everybody thought 2032. If they get 2028, it's a bonus. And obviously, we've got 2028. So I think, as I say, those countries that are not getting a lot of revenue are very excited by this. They sort of see a lot more investment from their governments, access to high performance programs, all that sort of thing. Very exciting times for those countries. Not necessarily the countries are actually going to be playing in the Olympics. That's so interesting because, yeah, for what we were watching on our side, the Indian TV rights were a big deal for cricket being in the games. Do you really think that India cares to see? I mean, are they going to pay up, do you think, to see cricket in the Olympics? I think they will. International cricket is a big business in India. The IPL's TV rights, that's the Indian Premier League, the main cricket league over there, are now, I think, out higher than the ones for the NFL and behind only the uh, Premier League football over here in England. So it's it's big business. They like to see the best players playing. There, there was occasionally talk about it being like football, where you'd have under-23 players with you know, a few overage players. The IOC wasn't interested in that. They wanted the best players. Because they knew that's how they get the big money from Indian TV companies. As somebody who doesn't know much about cricket, and I think, like you said, a bunch of our listeners are in this boat, when I think of cricket, technically, I think of something that lasts several days, one match lasting multiple days. A, why? But B, I know there's going to be a shorter version of cricket in the games. So let's first talk about why cricket takes so long to play and then get into the version that was developed for more, I wouldn't say TV consumption, but maybe for non-cricket countries. 
the, the why is I think probably lost to history. It just beca- it just sort of became that way. So the longest form of cricket, which is multi day cricket, if you like, would last four or five days. Most cricket doesn't last four or five days at the top level of the international game, the top level of the domestic games in the major cricket playing countries. It will last three or four days. Most cricket around the world lasts one day, where they play one innings aside. You bat for as long as you can bat until you reach a certain limit of overs, and over is a set of six balls or pitches, if you like, to use a baseball parlance. As far as the shorter version of cricket that's going to be in the Olympics, which is called 2020 cricket, uh, which coincidentally enough was founded 20 years ago, (laughs) quite quite fortunately, it lasts 20 overs per side, so that's in total of 120 balls per team. It was invented partly for TV reasons, partly because it was invented in England. Um, partly it was because cricket attendances were down, because if it's taken all day, you can only really go to an entire match if it's at the weekend. So in England, 2020 cricket was, it's, you know, the game started at half five, six o'clock. So after work, you can go, you can watch for the evening. And obviously in the summer here, we get uh, quite long evenings. It's light till nearly till after 9pm in the north of England. So it's easier for people to go to the games. Uh, And then it sort of spread around the world from there into the major cricket-playing countries. And then it's spread outside of there. The ITC eventually (laughs) identified that this is a potential growth area for the game. So being very keen to push those associate members, those lower-ranked members into T20 cricket to grind grow the game there because it's it's short, it lasts between three and three and a half hours, so about the same length as a baseball game. So it, it's thought to be more marketable and be able to spread around the world, and that was that's the form that's obviously going to be in the Olympics. How do cricket purists feel about the change in, in format? <laughs> um, hey, oh, God, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's, a tricky, that's a tricky subject. Cricket purists have a sort of reaction to T20 cricket that can be a little, yeah, a little negative, sometimes very negative. But I mean, a lot of those cricket purists still don't like the fact that cricket went down to one day domestically rather than three days. Um, so, and they don't like how it's no longer played in white, um, it's played in coloured clothing. Purists in any sport will always bristle against innovation a very easy way to start an argument amongst cricket fans is to talk about t20 cricket a lot of them do not like it and will sometimes adamantly refuse to watch it including some commentators even will refuse to commentate on t20 cricket it's here to stay you know i think anything i'm very much not a traditionalist i think anything that gets more people interested in the game is a good thing in, in any sport and I think tradition count is important, but you shouldn't get bogged down by it. I need to go back to the multi-day cricket matches. How long are you there a day? If it's a um, three-day match or four-day match, how, how long is the play going on? Uh, usually six to six and a half hours. There's intervals every two hours. The cliche is cricketers break for lunch and for tea, which is true. In T20 cricket, they don't. There's a sort of 10, 15-minute break between innings and that's that's it there's no lunch break there's no tea break but if you're out there for six you know six and a half hours you need some breaks you know you can't actually be (laughs) physically out there in the sun for six and a half hours let's just go through some basic cricket terminology so t20 game how many players are on a team there are 11 players per team will all of them be on the field when it is their turn to field yes okay so there's no necessarily reserves in the back. So there are reserves in the back okay. who can come on in the event of injuries to the fielders. The reserves aren't allowed to bat in the game. If you get an injury, that's tough, unless it's a concussion, in which case you are allowed to replace a, replace a batter. What does the field look like? Yeah, so the, the whole cricket field, there's no sort of, it's, it's like baseball, there's no sort of fixed sort of, mm-hmm. you know, your distance or size of a field or shape. It's normally sort of roughly oval shapes, about 150 yards in each direction. 
a diameter of 150 yards, essentially. And then there's a, a strip in the middle of it which is just rolled and with a heavy roller until that's really flat and hard and bouncy and will have minimal grass on it. That's where most of the action takes place. You have a bowler who will come in, run in and bowl the ball. They specifically don't throw the ball like you would in baseball. I won't get into the technical... The, the, what defines a throw is very complicated and has changed over the years. As because like, as sort of super slow motion photography came in, it turned out that by the letter of law, every single ball that was actually throwing the ball. So they had to change the rules to allow some straightening of the arm is the term that they used. The ball would not... Most of the time would bounce um, in front of the batter. And there are two batters at each end. They run from one end to the other to score a run. There are ways to score. So if you hit, the, there's a boundary rope around the field. If you hit the ball over the boundary on the fly, that's an automatic six runs. If you hit it over the rope and it's bounced first, that's an automatic four runs. That's the sort of gist of the scoring. There's various ways of getting out. So there are two sets. Of, there is a set of stumps at each end. So that's uh, or a wicket. It, everything in cricket has multiple names depending on who, you, who, you're, who you're talking to. It's but not, way, which, 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 which is one of the reasons why I think it gets a bit sort of opaque and, and, for and newcomers. Wick, oh, yeah, and a wicket looks a little like a croquet wicket, correct? Yeah, I, I think if you uh, go back into the depths of history, they probably do have this, it probably does have the same etymological sort of origin. But it's obviously there's three stumps rather than two, as you can see in croquet. And on top of the stumps, there's what are called bales. So if the bowler hits those, hits that wicket while the batter's batting, that's an out. So that's sort of like a strikeout in baseball, if you like. If you catch the ball on the fly, again, like in baseball, it's an out. Various other forms of getting out, probably beyond the scope of this podcast, some of them are quite esoteric. Some of them are more common. The more common ones would be a run out. So if the fielder, fielding team get the ball to the stumps before the runner, runners have completed a run, that can be an out. If the ball hits the batter whilst they are in the process of taking a shot and it would have gone on to hit the stumps plus various other conditions, that can be an out as well. Those are the most common types of outs in, in, in cricket. There's lots of other esoteric ways that don't happen particularly often. And uh, to be honest, most cricket fans, as I was saying earlier, probably don't even know all of them and know exactly how they And most even cricket players don't really know how the other forms of getting out happen. Do you bat until you get out? Is yes. that the deal? Okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah, you do. There's an, and unlike, obviously, in baseball where you could, the batting order circulates, cir- is in a circle, once, you know, the, once the number nine hitter is out, the number one hitter would come back in. That isn't the case in cricket. Once you ten, once there's been ten outs, that ends the inning, no matter how often, how long it's lasted. So ten outs is all out. Okay, which then makes sense as to why a game can last so long. Yes, if you're batting and batting until you get out. You just keep going sometimes. Yes. Okay. And as I said, you know, believe it or not, in the in the past there have been games that have been played with no time limit. Uh, there are two games in, in the history of international cricket that went to ten days. And in one of the in one of those cases, the game had to be abandoned because the England team had to leave to get a boat back home. That is in the past. That's before World War Two. <laughs> After that doesn't happen anymore. You very occasionally will get a six day game. But for majority at the top level of international cricket, the longest form is five days. I'm trying not to make a joke about boats and airplanes, but that's fantastic. <laughs> okay, yes. so in baseball, things that are really exciting would be, say, a home run and a strikeout. So what would be really exciting plays that we would see in cricket? So obviously a six, as I said, which is when the batter hits the ball over the boundary rope on the fly. That's a six. That's a bit, that's cricket's equivalent of a home run. And a strikeout would be bowled when the ball hits the wickets at the other end of the pitch. How big is this ball and how heavy is it? Well, that's a question. <laughs> it's about the same size as a baseball. It's harder than a baseball. It's made with a harder leather. 
Um, and then the seam is around the equator of the ball rather than sort of like a tennis ball type seam. Um, I think the weight of it is about five and a half ounces off the top of my head. I could be wrong. So it's not something I particularly <laughs> look up. Or, or, or the noise that if it does hit you, it does hurt. Um, so, so that's why cricketers wear a lot of padding, certainly more than they do in baseball. So again, obviously in baseball, hit by pitch, the runner, go, the batter goes to first base. Cricket, that's not the case. Hitting the batter is, unless you have been try, purposely trying to injure the batter, <laughs> hitting the batter is actually allowed in cricket. What is the strategy behind that? Basically to disturb the batter, uh, to try and sort of get them off off strike. Actually, so what's called short-pitched bowling, where the ball bounces some distance away from the batter and goes up towards the head. That's usually limited in how often you can do that. If you, if, and if the umpire thinks you're doing it too often, they will issue a warning. And if you carry on doing it, you'll be prevented from bowling anymore. So it's it's not unlimited. It's not, a, you know, it's, I'm, I'm, it probably sounds like it's a very violent sport. It isn't, it isn't violent at all. We've learned more about the damage that cricket balls can actually do to the body. I know it sounds ridiculous. Famously, the helmet was invented in the 1970s to use the euphemistic term abdominal protector for the area a bit lower down was invented 100 years before that, um, which probably gives a bit of insight into men's priorities, I suppose. (laughs) So we have a hard ball that we're hitting with velocity, but the fielders don't have any mitts or any gloves or anything, do they? So one 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 fielder does have gloves. That's what they call the wicket keeper. So the equivalent of the catcher in baseball, he does have gloves. Most because he's fielding fielding the ball a lot. It's coming into him at some pace, you know, ninety miles an hour, eighty miles an hour. So he needs gloves. Otherwise, his hands are going to be broken by the end of the end of the game. The other fielders don't have gloves, and that's probably the main sort of distinction between baseball and cricket in terms of the fielding side of things, lack of a glove. So baseball fans, just we're using baseball as, a, as a, the easy analogy, are rowdy and loud and can be very obnoxious. Is this true in this very gentlemanly cricket game? So, the, I mean, the cricket being a sort of gentlemanly game is a bit of a myth. There was probably, there probably is a period when it was very sort of gentlemanly uh, game. The history of cricket, it was largely, and I'm going to get into a very deep history of cricket, it was rich landowners would get their strongest players, the working class players, to play the game for them and bet huge sums of money on it. It was never really a sort of genteel pastime between you know, people who live in the country. That's the image that cricket likes to portray itself as. Like all things, it's a bit of a myth. But the, you know, the English spectators tend to be probably more reserved than a lot of spectators in other countries. And that, that sounds like I'm making some sort of generalisations, but even in, within England, there are some spectators who will be more rowdy than others. Certainly if you go to somewhere like India, their spectators are you know, incredibly passionate, loud, noisy, really cheer on the team. And same in sort of Australia, New Zealand as well all over the sort of Indian subcontinent. And yeah, so the fans, like any sport, can vary from being very sort of genteel and polite. In T20 cricket, they tend to be a bit more rowdy. Are there cricket hooligans? Oh, um, occasionally. <laughs> yeah, most of, the, most of the early sort of cases of streaking in sport happened in cricket, believe it or not. There are various famous instances from the 70s and on, onwards of uh, uh, people streaking at the cricket it's tended to be a bit more I think certainly in England uh, I think spectator safety became quite important in all sports we had a couple of crowd disasters in the 80s you may be familiar with them which sort of meant that spectators were a lot closely policed at, at sporting venues and you you rarely get those instances now occasionally you'll get a fan who run onto the field they are very swiftly dealt with, as they should be, because we've seen incidents in other sports where people have rushed onto the field without your know, good intentions, and you never know what's going to happen these days. So, yeah, it's it's rare. It does happen, like in any sport. 
but when it does happen, it's usually swiftly dealt with and, and everybody moves on. Okay, good. So we who have never seen a cricket match do not need to worry about certain fan behavior. We can just sort of follow the crowd and we'll be good. Yes. Yeah, it, and I think the the best thing to do is to just to learn the game is to watch it. And it, it, it becomes difficult because a lot of TV coverage of cricket in non-traditional cricket play countries is on minority sort of cable channels. Willow TV is the one that's in, in the US. Some cricket is now in the US. It's on um, is it ESPN Plus, the sort of ESPN streaming service. So there's some cricket on that. There are sort of free streams of cricket various around the world, in various places around the world, which you can find as well. Not always the top level of stuff is available for free, like anything in life. You can find it if you look for it, and the best way to learn is is to watch the game, which is the case, I think, in a lot of sports. If you watch it enough, you'll pick it up. And as I, said, I do recommend T20 for newcomers because it's a short version of the game. And it's very sort of easy to pick up and it's very easy to... If you know baseball, you will be able to figure out what's going on eventually if you watch it enough. I came at it from the other side of things. I sort of discovered baseball about 25 years ago and I just I figured it out by watching the game and uh, it works the, in the other direction as well. There are American cricket journalists and American cricket writers who have sort of come to the game from baseball and but have managed to understand the game through their knowledge of baseball and it works and so it works in both directions the uk india who else should we be looking for in los angeles australia i would imagine would would be sort of dead search to qualify pakistan sri lanka now i think they're talking about a five team tournament uh with you obviously the us I, well i say obviously it's not always the case i know that host nation doesn't always get to play but I would hope the US does. So I, I reckon those are probably the most likely five participants. One of the best sort of T20 teams in the world is the West Indies, which is a group of mostly English territories and countries, English-speaking territories and countries in the Caribbean. So the, the former colonies, or in, in some sense, current colonies. We won't get into a colony. <laughs> Cricket is very intrinsically linked with colonialism, but we, we won't get into that, I think, for, for this podcast. But obviously they would participate separately in the Olympics. So you wouldn't see that West Indies team in there. I think if the West Indies were at the top of the rankings or whatever they do for the qualification, they I would expect they would have an internal qualifying thing. So you may see Jamaica or Barbados at the at the Olympics. It's, it's a possibility. That happened in the Commonwealth Games here last year. So the West Indies had a women's cricket team that had met the qualifying criteria, but obviously they had to have a qualifying competition internally there. So, yes, yeah, so as you should probably say, cricket, it was in the Commonwealth Games last year. It was in the Commonwealth Games back in 1998, a men's tournament. It's been in the Asian Games on and off since 2010. It's been the Pacific Games on and off since going way back to 1979. And that was more of a the longer 50 over form. Obviously, in the Olympics back in 1900, it was one multi-day match, which lasted two days in that case. So, yeah, it's it's been in these multi-sport events before. I think it's in the uh, African Games next year. I think it's next year. So, yeah, it's been in these events events before. So they would have to split up West Indies unless they made an exception. Yes. Okay. Um, basically, and that, as, as it... England would become part of Great Britain. Much like, yes. yeah, so much like other team sports, but then in like World Cup soccer, England and Wales, and they all split apart in Scotland. So the England team actually represents England and Wales. There's a sort okay. of silent oh, and okay. Wales in the England team. Scotland play separately, and then Ireland plays an all Ireland team as well. Um, you can't get away from colonialism in in these sports yeah. because of because of this as you're talking it breaks up and you you're like wait a second that's but i think that matters in yes. cricket in a way because that's where it that's where the growth came from yeah the common sort of thing is you get independence from england you get good at cricket then you beat england at cricket that's <laughs> that's a sort of journey for a lot of countries canada hasn't quite done that yet um so <laughs> You know, a lot of, the, of those 12 full members, 
only Afghanistan is is the only one that's never been part of the Commonwealth or British Empire as it was. In fact, going back, and this will tell you a lot about cricket's administration, when the ITC was formed, which is now the International Cricket Council, it was the Imperial Cricket Conference. Very grandiose name. And at that point, actually, your listeners may be interested to know, the USA were actually one of the best teams in the world in cricket. Who They were probably, after England and Australia, were probably the best team in the world. But they weren't allowed to join the Imperial Cricket Conference because you've sort of left us... Uh, a few uh, 150 <laughs> years earlier. A war a yeah. few years ago. Yeah. Um, still hasn't gotten over, over it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and on that as well, so cricket, the founding fathers played cricket. There is evidence of George Washington playing cricket at Valley Forge during the Revolutionary War or War of Independence, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. So cricket, and even in that, some of the founding fathers objected to the use of the term president for the head of state of the US because the head of a cricket club is a president and it was considered to be beneath um, the head of state to be called, have the same t- same job title as the, head of, as the head of a cricket club. So cricket has a quite a sort of key place in US history, uh, which I think a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, but so coming back to to cricket, and as I say, there was an attempt to include it in the 1904 games. The US had, as I say, one of the best players in the world at that point. One of the best players ever to play the game was an American who set records that were not beaten for 50 years, 50, 60 years. Um, in some cases, the, the guy by the name of Bart King, I recommend your listeners look up. He's, he's very... Um, not very well known player in, even in cricket circles and in American sports circles, almost unknown, but is a was one of the best players in the world. Some early baseball players played both sports. George Wright, and who uh, led the first ever professional baseball team, played cricket as well. He played Major League Baseball, as did his brother Harry Wright, and both played for the US national cricket team and are both in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Their dad actually played in the first international cricket match, which was in New York. It was USA against Canada. I'm sorry to tell you that Canada did win that match. And that was in 1844. So cricket has this long history in the US. But when the ITC formed, the cricket community kept the US out. So South Africa joined the ITC instead of the USA. And cricket, and part of this was, Cricket was mostly popular in sort of wealthy communities in Philadelphia and in New York. They weren't particularly, as wealthy people tend not to be, weren't particularly open into sharing their sort of big country clubs with you know, the common folk, the uh, working class. Barking happened to be an exception because he was so good they couldn't ignore him. He, he was a working class kid. They got him a job so that he could play cricket as cricket. You know, an amateur sport in those days. So there's this sort of long history. And then it's because they weren't trying to reach out, and certainly in New York, they wouldn't let West Indian immigrants play. So obviously there's a racial element to this as well, as the, as, as, as often crops up in, in the history of sport in the US, sadly. So it didn't sort of try and expand what was a small cricket community. And it sort of withered and died as a result until the sort of 50s and 60s where you start to gain a lot of immigration from the Caribbean and from South Asia. And that's sort of when cricket had a bit of a renaissance in the USA. So the ICC changed the I from imperial to international in 1965. And at that, that was the first point they allowed non-Commonwealth countries to join. The first two non-Commonwealth countries were the USA and the Netherlands. Um, Dutch cricket has a long history as well that I think a lot of people aren't aren't aware of. The Netherlands are probably the one of the best sort of non Commonwealth countries in in the game. Obviously Afghanistan uh, are the best at the moment. Netherlands probably second best. And so they joined in nineteen sixty five. The USA have been uh, at various times expelled from the ICC or suspended. I mean the politics around cricket administration in the US probably makes the sort of presidential election look positively sane. Um, so, um, so to, to give you an idea of what it is, 
there are sort of various. If I, I recommend that um, your your listeners Google Kenwin Williams and Facebook, that's Kenwin K E N W Y N Williams and Facebook, and you will be entertained at what was previously a high ranking cricket administrator in the US was doing on social media. <laughs> I won't get into the details. I'll, I'll leave that as a nice sort of surprise for your listeners. It's very entertaining of, of what was going on. So the ITC, as I said, the ex, they suspended the USA Cricket Association at various times. I'm trying to remember this off the top of head in 2005, then again in 2007, then again, I think in 2014, and they were finally expelled, I think, 2016. I think I'm getting my dates right here. And then a new cricket board was formed and the and the ITC let the USA back in. The ITC has long targeted the US as a major place for its country because there are a lot of cricket fans in the US, such a big country with a large sort of immigrant population from the Caribbean, from India and Pakistan and places like that who have sort of kept cricket alive in the US. So any cricket website, usually their, sort of, your, the, their top sort of readership will be from India. And you, the USA is normally somewhere in the top five. That's certainly the case with the cricket website I write for, even though we, we very rarely would cover the USA, a lot of our readership is from the USA. And so there is a big market for cricket. And, and again, and, you you could say this is sort of modern day colonialism, except it's now money that people are after rather than resources and yeah and people in another sense. So it's it's eyeballs that cricket has been after in the US. There has been a long there has been several attempts to launch a T Twenty professional league in the US. There was one attempt right in the very early days of T Twenty in two thousand and four which until this year was the only league to actually have a season. A friend of mine by the name of Peter Della Pena, who's an American cricket journalist, has long said, whenever you see news of a T20 league launch in the US, do not believe it's going to happen until the first game starts, until the bowler is actually running in to bowl the first ball. Do not think it's going to start. And then last year, eventually, after a couple of delays because of covid Major League Cricket was launched in the US, uh, sorry, this year. Minor League Cricket was launched a couple of years before that. And that was reasonably successful, and that's going to hopefully continue as long as the cricket administration in the US doesn't have another meltdown, as it has has had a tendency to do in in recent years. It's amazing that they got it in for LA 2028. And I get from the... International Olympic Committee side, well, we would really like to see cricket to get the yeah. Indian money, but with USA being the bad seed of cricket, I'm just amazed that they got it in for this this game. Yeah, and and a lot of that is, is to say, you know, the ICC when they look at the US cricket sees dollar signs, and they see lots of cricket fans, and if they can have, you know, the T20 World Cup is being co-hosted by the West Indies and USA next year. I think they are playing somewhere on Long Island in the sort of New York metro area, in the Dallas area, and in, I think, in Florida. I'll have to double check that. There is a cricket facility in Los Angeles in a place called Woodley Park. Interestingly, this may interest people, the cricket in Los Angeles was originally founded by British actors in the 1930s. So you would have games where it was... um, you would have Boris Karloff playing. So you've got, you know, coming out to bat and behind the wicket is Frankenstein's monster. Uh, so you, And um, there was a guy whose name escapes me now who actually captained England at cricket and later became a Hollywood actor. And he was sort of behind it. I'm racking my brains and I can't quite remember the name now, unfortunately. But um, yeah, that was where sort of cricket in Los Angeles was founded. And then the, the Woodley Park facility was just open. We just hosted a couple of low level international tournaments. I think for the Olympics they'll probably want to you know, there's no sort of facilities for spectators, for example, at the at the ground. I think they'd want to sort of put in some, you know, temp maybe temporary seating and whatnot and putting, you know, more facilities for the media and the like, so to be able to actually host that tournament. So there is there is a facility in Los Angeles there. It would need I think a lot of work for a major international tournament. Okay, barring Boris Karloff coming back 
for Los Angeles, which I'm going to be thinking about that for a long time. Why should we be watching cricket? What's the what's your elevator pitch for cricket? It's if it's a fun sport. It's 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 entertaining. I think especially in the T20 format, you 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 don't get long pauses in play like you see in the longer forms of the game. I wouldn't say it's all action all the time, but it's a lot of action a lot of the time. It, it's it's quick. It's fast. It's high scoring. The, the common sort of thing where you'd say is the difference between baseball and cricket is in baseball outs happen a lot runs happen rarely in cricket it's the other way around outs happen rarely runs happen a lot a normal score in a t20 game might be 150 to 200 runs each side there have been even higher scores than that so 250 280 even you wouldn't see this in the olympics in the olympics where it's the best teams playing but when you get uh, sort of you know teams playing that are a very different skill you will sometimes hit scores of over 300. So that's off, as I say, 120 balls, 120 pitches, if you, if you want to use the baseball term. So they're scoring a lot of runs. The fielding is tends to be more athletic in T20 cricket because, you know, you, you, as I say, outs are at a premium. So you want to try and, you know, you'll see diving catches, one-handed catches. Um, you'll see your players making your know, really good throws you'll see especially when you get to sort of boundary fielding you'll see very sort of bizarre athletic moves where they you'll try and parry the ball over to another player to take the catch rather than it go over the rope so you get lots of very entertaining and very quick play in t20 cricket in the olympics the us i hope will be playing cricket has a tendency to not do the obvious when it comes to promoting itself which is unfortunate so i hope the u.s will be playing it's a, and it'll be a chance for the wider public in the u.s to to see cricket and see cricket at, the, at a very high level what about the women's side how well developed is the is women's cricket so in the in the top level countries cricket is very well developed for the women especially in the uk in australia in India and New Zealand are probably the strongest teams in international women's cricket. Less so in the in some of the other Asian countries, for, for largely for uh, cultural reasons. So Pakistan the women's cricket isn't as well developed. Women's cricket in Afghanistan, for reasons that I think your audience will be well aware, is at the moment non-existent. There was an Afghanistan women's cricket team that were trading before the Taliban takeover. They have they have now now all fled the country. And there is a there is some controversy at the moment over the Afghani. So Af- one of the requirements to be a full member of the ICC is to have an active women's team, and Afghanistan don't have that active women's team. So there's a lot of controversy around that at the moment. I just I think I read recently that the IOC are looking at actually banning Afghanistan from the Olympics uh, because of that sort of lack of women's support. So Afghanistan probably would be in the running to qualify for the men's tournament, but obviously may not be able to because of that ban. This is unfortunate in a sense because there's some very exciting players in Afghanistan. It's not their fault, I suppose, that that the Taliban have taken over and a lot of them are very sort of anti the, the Taliban and but aren't necessarily voc- <laughs> vocally opposing it for obvious reasons because you know for safety reasons. And so women's cricket yeah, so, so New Zealand, India, England Australia, probably the strongest teams. You probably you may see Sri Lanka as well, another team from the Indian continent. Qualified. The USA women's team is not as strong as the men's team, to put it as politely as possible. They have had a, a you know a couple of players come in from other cricket playing countries recently who have US parents or you know, were born in the US. There's a female player obviously had, who plays domestically in England called Tara Norris, who was born in Philadelphia. So she's played for the US national team. So they've had some good players, but women's cricket, I think, is with all the sort of administrative problems that US cricket has faced, that, and I think it sadly is the, the case in a lot of sports where the administration sort of falls off. Women's cricket tends to be the, uh, the, the one that sort of falls off the most, because most cricket administrators are men, of course, these are sadly often the case but yeah women's cricket is a growth area and in terms of a sort of non-traditional playing countries as well it's very different in in the women's game than it is in the men's game for example some of the 
some of the best teams in women's cricket outside of the big cricket, cricket playing countries are teams like Thailand, Brazil, and Germany, who are almost nowhere in men's cricket. We're well short of qualifying for World Cups. Thailand have qualified for a, a women's World Cup, and I sort of push on the sort of door of qualifying for others as well. So I think a lot of countries have targeted women's cricket as an obvious sort of way of actually getting to the top of the game. It's a lot probably easier. There are less really good women's teams than there are men's teams, so it's a lot easier for them to get to the top. Certainly that's the case in, as I say, Thailand and Brazil. So Brazil actually have a professional women's team. The men's team are completely amateur, which is very different than what you often see in in sport. Interesting. Alison, opportunity. Are you saying I need to play cricket? I mean, there's an opportunity there. (laughs) Because all I know about... the game and learn how to play at the same time. Okay, because before we sat down, all I know about cricket is that the cricket bat gets used as a murder weapon in a lot of British TV. (laughs) That is what I knew about cricket. (laughs) Yeah, that, that, that's not quite uh, not, not, I don't think it's the most common murder weapon. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hefty piece of lumber. Um, it, 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 it doesn't break as easy as a baseball bat. I would, I would much rather have a cricket bat under my bed than a baseball bat uh, as, a, as, a, as a weapon. You, know, you can very easily knock someone out with a cricket bat. That very rarely the one, the, I say very rarely happens. There was an incident in Canada about 15 years ago where... Pakistan were playing, I think India actually, in just outside of Toronto, and one of the crowd hurled some insults at one of the uh, Pakistani players who wasn't exactly known for his uh, athletic build, shall we say? Um, and the the Pakistani player actually went into the stands with a cricket bat to try and swing at him and was arrested by the Toronto police. Um, so I know I said earlier there isn't cricket hooliganism. You're probably more likely to see it from the players than you are from the fans. That is mercifully rare. That's just one sort of incident from the annals of cricket history. Yeah. If, if you do, if you do want to play the game, there are so you know. I suppose there's transferable skills in sports that are popular in America. Obviously, baseball and softball. There is an obvious sort of similarity there. But there's transferable skills from sort of tennis and from hockey, both ice hockey and field hockey. That one, a recent U.S. international cricket player actually transferred from field hockey. She played at a high level of field hockey in college in the U.S. and transferred to cricket late in life and got picked for the national team. She started playing cricket in her mid-30s and got picked for the national team. So there are, you know, it's, not, it's not out of the question that you can start playing cricket late in life in a sort of developing cricket nation and make the national team. So it's not out of the question... Obviously, at the time of the year we're at now, there's not much cricket going on, even even in America. I think some of the sort of southern states do have some cricket being played at this time of the year. I know there's a cricket league in, I think, either Arizona or New Mexico that plays at this time of year because it, obviously it's just so hot in the summer there. Um, they would play a sort of October to sort of March season. Uh, so there will be some cricket going on in America, but obviously it really picks up pace in sort of May, June, like in any sort of northern hemisphere country. Excellent. Andrew, thank you so much. You've given us a ton of stuff to think about, and we're I, I'm starting to look forward to this. I'm, I'm excited. Looking, I, thought, I know. He buried, gonna... Andrew buried the lead on the hooligan story. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Andrew. You can follow Andrew on Twitter or X. He is at AndrewNixon79. On Blue Sky, he is at AndrewNixon.bsky.social. And Cricket Europe's website is CricketEurope.com. We'll have links to all of those in the show notes. And a special thank you to listener Hillary for connecting us with Andrew. Well, we have a Kickstarter going. Speaking of getting to the next Olympics. That's right. So we launched the Kickstarter campaign on October 27th. It's going to run through December 9th. We've got some amazing incentives, including our fantastic new Paris pin and the Paris viewing guide and... You can be in an exclusive WhatsApp group with us while we are in Paris. Did That's you know exciting. about? Did you know I about did know. that? <laughs> I'm I'm very excited about it to be chatting with everybody. So you can find the Kickstarter campaign through our website. It's right on the Facebook. If you go to our website, 
flamealivepod.com. There are some Kickstarter icons right there, and that'll take you to the project, and you can give us a shout out for that. That's right. We've launched okay, but we do need support in order to make this trip possible and to keep the show going. So please help keep our flame alive. That sound means it is time for our history moment. All year long, we've been looking at the Seoul 1988 Games as it is the 35th anniversary of that event. My turn for a story. And I wanted to talk about Greco-Roman wrestling, specifically the super heavyweight category, which for the first time at Seoul, and we love first times. We do. super heavyweight category had a weight limit. So prior to this, It did not have an upper weight limit, so you had wrestlers weighing upwards of 182 kilograms or 400 pounds. Oh, geez. (laughs) Now the maximum is 130 kilograms or 286 pounds. Also, no big. (laughs) That's not not a small size to move around either. Though I would be concerned about the people who are trying to make weight. And they had to lose 100 pounds. (laughs) Well, the final of this event was a battle of Iron Curtain strongmen. In one corner, you had Bulgarian Rangel Jarofsky, the reigning bronze medalist from the 1987 World Champs. Jarofsky won his first three bouts by passivity. He beat Egyptian Hassan El Haddad by 5-0 decision. And then he beat Japan's Kazuya Deguchi 14-0 to make it to the gold round match. Does passivity mean they took one look at him and just (laughs) laid down and said, no, I am not. I am not wrestling that man. (laughs) Not today. (laughs) Um, The other side of the bracket featured a young upstart 21 year old who had joined the Soviet national team just the year before, but had been a two time world junior champ. His promise was so great that he was the Soviet Union's flag bearer for Seoul 1988. His name? Alexander Karelin. Oh, we've heard that name before. That's right. This is Karelin's first Olympics. He is out to prove himself. In his first two rounds, Karelin won on passivity calls. In round three, he took down Austrian Alexander Neumüller in a fall. In round four, he trounced American Dwayne Kozlowski 15-0, racking up the maximum number of points allowed within two and a half minutes. In the finals, Jarofsky quickly got three points by throwing Karelin. A shock. But then uh, there was a penalty, so Jarofsky had to go into the parterre position where he gets down on the ground and Karelin has to try to lift him up and throw him over. And that's Karelin's signature move, as we would come to find out over the decades. Karelin, even at this age, looks like he's chiseled out of marble. If you look at it, and and Jarofsky looks like a big guy, big, super heavyweight type of guy. Karelin is a chiseled statue at this point. Uh, He could lift another super heavyweight man and throw them down to the ground. This time he did not quite get Jarofsky down, but he got a couple points. So they're now three, two. And that's what the score is going into the final round. In that round, Karelin gets penalized. He has to go into parterre, but Jarofsky can't lift him up. At all. Because he is a marble statue. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, Karelin wins an additional point on a warning, which forced Jarofsky back into parterre. And that's when Karelin does it. He flips him over, makes it a 5-3 game, and then runs out the clock to win the gold medal. One of the videos I watched, uh, which I will link to it in the show notes, it's a British commentator who says after the match, this could be a man with a very, very bright future. <laughs> What an understatement. My right? goodness. So Alexander Karelin would go on to dominate the sport for over a decade. He won golds at 1992 and 1996 before a massive upset in the finals at Sydney 2000 by American Rulon Gardner. Gardner handed Karelin his first loss in 13 years. Uh, Karelin's three golds and one silver would be the biggest medal haul by an Olympian in wrestling until Tokyo 2020 when Mijian Lopez of Cuba won his fourth gold medal. So um, Karelin has gone on to have beyond sport. He went on to have a career in uh, the government in Russia 
uh, Drofsky, uh also competed at Barcelona, but he only made it to the second round. And sadly, he died in 2004 on a fishing trip when his fishing line hit an overhead power line and electrocuted him. I was about to say shocking, and then I realized how bad that would be. <laughs> Welcome to Shiflistan. And now is the time of the show where we check in with our team, Keep the Flame Alive. These are past guests and listeners who make up our citizenship of Shiflistan, our very own country. Some Pan Am Games results. Tim Sherry won silver in the men's three position 50 meter air rifle. Evan, Dunf <clears throat> Evan Dunphy's hamstring injury from earlier this year took a toll on his fitness, and he finished ninth in the 20-kilometer walk at the Pan Am Games. And also, Shiflistani Rob Snook has been commentating at Pan Am Games. And also, if you check out his Instagram, a little DJing. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, Team Schuster has quali qualified for the playoffs at the Sioux Curlers Fall Classic, but did not make it past the quarterfinals. Andrew Marinus's next book will be on the first Special Olympics, which was held in Chicago 1968. If you have a connection to that event or know any of the organizers, participants, or their families, or have expertise on how people with disabilities were treated in the 1960s, Andrew would be very grateful for some input and advice. His Twitter handle is TrueBlue24, that's T-R-U-B-L-U-24. And parachuter McKenna Gear's husband was in a work accident and sustained a back injury. Although workers' compensation is involved, he will be off of work to, for 10 to 14 weeks to heal. And... Workers' compensation in the U.S., it varies state by state for what you get. So we don't know if his full compensation, his full salary will be compensated while he heals. So a GoFundMe has been started for them, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Je regarde le cinéma. <laughs> Duolingo's going well for you. <laughs> I got a whole sentence there. <laughs> so other things you can regard, uh, that would be the opening ceremonies. We have a little bit of news from French TV channel RMC Sport. They report that there's going to be 300,000 free seats for the opening ceremonies, and these will be on upper platforms along the Seine. This is in addition to the 100,000 ticketed places that are going to be on the lower part of the Seine the the article said something like close to touching the water, but uh, the lower ticketed places will have a better viewing position. It sounds like uh, this is important. If you want to see the opening ceremonies for free, you will need a ticket. So this ticketing plan is supposed to launch at the beginning of 2024, and it's going to be run by France's ministry of the interior. So we're going to do a little bit of research to figure out, what needs to happen for people who want these tickets, what the, the process is. The ceremony is also going to remain what they call adaptable, meaning that if there's going to be a strong security threat, the numbers of free tickets could be reduced. And that sounds like it could go all the way up to right before the ceremonies. They could decide how many people get in and how many people don't get in based on the threats around. There will, yeah. And if people waiting to get in are being stupid. Could be, could be. But I also think that if, if they start this, I mean, the ticketing process will probably be sold out pretty quickly. Oh, I would expect. So you'll have to claim your ticket pretty soon and hopefully not just show up and think you can get in. That I think will be an issue as well. And there's also going to be 80 giant screens along this 12 kilometer route so that you'll be able to watch uh, things that aren't happening right in front of you. Je regarde. <laughs> Le scrid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's some protests going on in Tahiti over a tower that the organizing committee wants to build in the surf. Generally, when there's uh, surfing competitions, there is a, a viewing platform, for lack of a better word, but it's covered. So it, it's like a viewing cabana. 
in the water, but it's on a platform. So the one in Tahiti is wood and they take it apart and dismantle it, it sounds like, when there is no surfing competition. The organizing committee wants to build one that is bigger. They say it needs to be bigger. It needs to be air conditioned. And it's going to be metal or aluminum. It's, but it's going to be not wood, basically. It does not need to be air conditioned. I cannot imagine. You went to Tahiti. You do not need your tower air conditioned. <laughs> Come on. Let me make sure I have this right. Yes. And, and it's going to have toilets. Well, supposedly. that. Right. Uh, well, I mean, you could run down in shifts, go back to whatever thing is on land to get a toilet. It's supposed to have space for 40 people. And the tower is supposed to meet some safety standards. The residents say the new construction is going to cause uh, damage to the coral reef and impact the marine ecosystem and potentially impact this perfect wave that the organ organizing committee is trying to chase. There's a ton of articles about this. One of the ones that we read is from The Guardian, but there's also words from uh, the Tahitian president who said who wasn't in charge when this was started, but it's like, oh, I really don't think this is a great idea now. And there's a lot of saying that there it's kind of hypocritical to say you're going to have this environmental friendly games and then build this giant tower here. The Tahitian president also said, I really wish we weren't putting it at this beach to get this wave. We could have put it in other areas that maybe didn't have this coral reef and have perfectly nice waves. But this is causing a little bit of concern now. Or maybe we could have, I don't know, had it in France. Totally different story. <laughs> but we want the wave. We want the wave. I'll give you a wave. Yeah. Also, other issues about housing. So several news outlets, including La Prisienne, say there are plans to rehouse more than 2,000 students during July and August 2024 and use their dorm rooms for firefighters, law enforcement, security, and other types of people for the games. The students would be rehoused for two months, given 100 euros and two Olympic tickets for their troubles. This, of course, is now tied up in the court system. So we're going to see what happens. If the rehousing is so good, why don't we just rehouse the people that they're rehousing? Like, why don't we just put the firefighters, the law enforcement, and the security in the rehousing instead of making the students move? One would think. I guess they want the location. It's another one of those sticky situations, I will say. And you didn't think this through. Once mm -hmm. again, you didn't think it through. LA, take note. Think it through. <laughs> I think they've already got a lock on those dorms, though, for the summer. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, right off the bat, you know, July. Yeah, but there are still students. I mean, like this, there are still students who are there in the summers. There are a lot of summer students. Yeah. But if you know ahead of time, like now for 28, you can't have a dorm for this summer, you plan around it. Right. And I, I would hope... I don't want to assume, but I hope and I'm pretty sure that's what LA 2028 has done. Also in the hopes and assumes, did you see the director of the opening ceremonies talking about, oh, it'd be nice to have Daft Punk reunite for the opening yes, ceremonies? Yes, and Daft Punk said, no, thank you. <laughs> like, again, the let me just come up with an idea and it will happen or let me get embarrassed in the press. You might have wanted to, I don't know, knock on their helmets and ask them first. <laughs> Just a thought. Let's end on a better note. Aviation A2Z reports that Qantas is adding a nonstop flight from Perth to Paris. It is similar to the flight they added to London in 2020, tw in 2012. This flight will start July 12th, 2024. It's a 17-hour nonstop that will be available four days a week and reduces the time to Paris by three hours. Though a 17-hour flight is no joke. No, it's a long, it's a that long is, flight. That's but... a long haul, but better than having to transfer and wait and sit because that's when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. The nonstop mm -hmm. flight, there's fewer things to go wrong. Exactly. So you folks in Western Australia, 
you get a good option. And that is going to do it for this week. Let us know what you think of Cricket. You can connect with us on X and Instagram at flamealivepod. Email us at flamealivepod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208-FLAME-IT. Be sure to join the Keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. And don't forget to get our weekly newsletter filled with other fun stories about this week's episode. You can look for that and our Kickstarter campaign at flamealivepod.com. Next week, we are going to look at what life is like for an elite athlete who has no country funding. We'll be talking with Irish skeleton racer. Yes, you heard that. Skeleton racer from Ireland. Brendan Doyle. We had a fascinating conversation with him that you won't want to miss. So thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep the flame alive.